So we're going to do our Bhakti Sutra commentary now, verse by verse investigation of this beautiful text on Bhakti Sutra. But please take your time. Those of you transitioning out of the Hatha Yoga class prior to this one, please take your time. You can rest in Shavasana. You can sit in meditation. You can maybe light some incense or candles. You know, you can enjoy the sunset through, the, th through Debbie's screen. Debbie always has seemingly the best sunsets. So <laughs> you can do whatever you need to do to transition into this next moment. So please take your time. No rush. I have a bit of preamble anyway, just introducing what this class is going to be about. So as you know, the tantric approach to meditation is jnana and bhakti as a support to raja. That's kind of a simplified way of saying it. But the tantric authors like Abhinava Gupta placed such a great emphasis on bhakti, on devotion, because they felt like without devotion, the power that you can get through meditation, and make no mistake, meditation confers tremendous power. That same power, which could be helpful to a devotion, uh, devotional person, could be very harmful to a person without a sense of a higher power. So such a person without devotion could become a sorcerer, meaning could be corrupted by the power, could start to use their siddhis for selfish purposes. Now, devotion is ultimately to be very direct, it's ultimately a cultivation of emotions. Devotion is ultimately the purification of vasanas, desires, emotions. And you know, to be clear, it's about motive force. Like I want chocolate cake, right? That's motive force. There's something moving me towards chocolate cake. In other words, we all of us want to taste and smell and touch and see and hear. There's this kind of emotional investment in sense pleasure. So worldliness, desire for the world and for bhoga experience is about motive force. All the jnana in the world won't necessarily help with this motive force. You could know that chocolate cake is not going to ultimately fulfill me. And yet you might still reach for the chocolate cake despite all your jnana. Of course, true jnana is about a lot more than the intellect. It's an insight that dramatically alters your emotional landscape too. So true jnana, is a spontaneous intuitive realization that can come in a flash and can permanently alter your desiring. So suddenly you no longer find those things that previously were so valuable, you don't find them tasteful anymore. They become tasteless. So that's real jnana, right? But most of us, before we get to that state of insight, which is always sudden, always spontaneous, before that, our intellectual understanding might not be sufficient to check the powerful emotional force that runs out towards objects that not only don't fulfill us, but that ultimately enslave us. So the world comes to whip us, as Swami Vivekananda said, you want to use, but you end up being used. You want to work, but you end up being worked. Worked like a dog, I might add. You want to enjoy, but you end up being the one who is enjoyed. The world has its way with you. And all because you can't emotionally divest energy in the world. You know? So this emotional cultivation is what we call bhakti. So in tantric yoga, bhakti is a big part of sadhana. Puja, puja is very important because puja is cultivating your relationship with the divine in a very tangible and concrete way. So we do bhakti practices like puja, we do um, sankirtana, nama japa, like that. We do all of these practices in, 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 the, in, in light of the goal of devo devotion, okay? So that's bhakti. Now, not, that's not enough. You must also wed your bhakti to jnana. So there's intellectual exercises, contemplation that we have to do. Why? Because again, if you're not clear about the goal, you might end up mistaking a lower attainment for final attainment. So as Abhinava Gupta warns, you might end up being in what is a glorified deep sleep state that the yogi sometimes finds themselves in, a state of tranquility, but a kind of, as we've been saying, nihilistic tranquility, a tranquility that is more tamas than sattva, a kind of inert space of thoughtlessness that is not at all radiant with the clear light, with the joy and, and power and, and poetry of ultimate attainment. So this deadened state, you can mistake it for the ultimate state if you don't have a clear, at least intellectual grasp of what the ultimate state should feel like. So it's very important to have an intellectual understanding of the goal and of the ideal and also of the path. So intellect is very important. This is jnana. And through proper intellectual cultivation, and through proper emotional cultivation, then meditation becomes magic. Because the power that you get doesn't become abused. It becomes channelized for higher and higher levels of realization. The intellect structures and guides. The emotions empower. And like that, when you sit for meditation, heart and head are perfectly aligned. 
in one flow towards the divine. Hey, that was a nice rhyme, right? Heart and head perfectly aligned in one flow towards the divine. I'm very proud of that. Thank you very much. I'm a bit disappointed that I didn't get more of a reaction to it. I'm kidding. So this is important that we balance both these aspects. So on Friday, a big part of my goal here is to study two texts next to one another. So it's Sanskrit text commentary, spiritual classics, but one of them will be a bhakti text and the other will be a jnana text. And so we started with Shri Shankara's Aparokshana Bhuti. We got about 11 verses in. Then we took a break to study Bhakti Sutra of Narada. Uh, we got 11 verses in. So now we're about 11 verses into both texts. So it's now time to return to our original intention, which is to study these texts side by side. It's kind of cool, right? So I just want to, I, I know I've been neglecting the Aparokshana Bhuti a little bit. I have, I, I needed to catch up on the Bhakti Sutra. And I told you last week that I would start with the Aparokshana Bhuti today. But I did say ma willing, I think, I hope, because I don't actually intend to start with the <laughs> Bhakti Sutra. So if, if I've spoken a falsehood, forgive me. I want to start with the Bhakti Sutra and then do Aparokshana Bhuti. The reason I want to do that is because there's a cleaner transition if I do it this way, because I want to make another point now. So I made one point already about why developing the heart and the head is important, okay? Because otherwise, when Siddhis come, they can be very destabilizing and dangerous without devotion and intellect. Or you might mistake lower states as the final state and therefore come to circumvent actual spiritual progress. You know? So that's one reason why we should do this, study bhakti and jnana. Another reason why is because they both play an essential role in spiritual life, just like a bicycle. Now, when you ride a bicycle, there are two wheels. I mean, of course, people do ride like tricycles and unicycles and all, but the very fact that those exist is confounding my metaphor right now. So I, I invoke poetic license, Imagine a world in which no unicycles or tricycles or any such thing existed, okay? <laughs> so a bicycle. For it to work, you need two wheels. Maybe a bird is a better metaphor. It flaps with two wings. It flies with two wings. In fact, we even see in some sense with two eyes. Of course, you can see with one eye, but you'll have no depth. <laughs> and of course, you could ride with one wheel, but you'll have no stability. I mean, you might, but... And you could flap one wing, but again, you'll go in circles. Oh my God, these metaphors are getting better and better. So notice... If you don't have jnana and bhakti together, you're either not going to have any depth or you're not going to, uh, you're going to go in circles or you're going to be very unbalanced. <laughs> wow, I'm even prouder of that one than the rhyme scheme earlier. <laughs> anyway, so here's the claim that we make. Here's why, here's why that's true. Jnana is negative in nature. It's a sword that cuts things away. It has a kind of, reductive effect. It pushes things away from you. That's what jnana does. The intellect is negative in nature. The intellect can never grasp truth. The intellect itself being finite and truth by nature being infinite. So of course, a finite tool can have very little jurisdiction in a place of infinite grandeur. So of course, the intellect cannot give you a direct grasp of truth. Absolutely not. Just cannot happen. Just by nature. So you can't intellect your way into truth. So what can you use the intellect for? To undo falsehoods. The inte intellect can show you what's not true so that you can intuitively, indirectly arrive at truth. So this is the indirect way. The intellect, meaning jnana, the jnana marga, the path of philosophy, can only do that. It can, by reduction, point out the truth. Leaving, you know, it, it burns away everything that's not the truth, leaving only the truth. So of course, like last night's lecture, there's this Shaiva metaphor of Lord Shiva dancing the Tandava and burning the whole universe up into little cinders and ashes. He, you know, he has this destructive dance at the end of every cycle. Uh, there's a pralaya, a moment of reabsorption, of dissolution. And Lord Shiva, seen in the typical mythology as like the destroyer deity of the tripartite creative force, he dances. And in this destructive dance, which Makali also does in this important myth in which she's standing on top of Lord Shiva, that's because Lord Shiva is containing her destructive dance, which if left to her own devices, she would have wrecked everything. You know? So this dance that burns everything to bits is a very important metaphor in Shaivism because the idea is that the fire of Lord Shiva, it tears asunder illusions, it burns away falsehoods, and it reduces everything to ash. So after Lord Shiva destroys the universe, he takes the ash of the universe and he spreads it over his body like a sadhu. And he sits there in meditation until the next cycle or until it's time to dance again. So notice, in the kind of Trinitarian idea of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the, the antiquated notion, which of course Shaivas don't hold. She, for Shaivas, they believe Shiva creates, maintains, and destroys. But we still imported into the tradition this like antiquated idea that Shiva destroys. Now, 
when he destroys, he reduces to ash. The metaphor here is that when you burn away falsehoods, what is left is some essence, some ground, some quiescent being, which is called awareness, which is what you are. So that's what dhyana does. It's a fire. It's a powerful, raging fire that with intellectual precision can be directed to burn away illusion. Now, if the fire is left unchecked without dhyana, that very same intellect that would help you now harms you. So the very same intellect that you would use for liberation typically gets used to create more duality. It names, it labels, it writes stories, and it, uh, it, it oppresses you with those stories. It tyrannizes you with its false dichotomies and false labels like that. It would make um, divisions of an indivisible sky and then convince you that those divisions are real, like that. So the fire can be a huge forest fire, burn all the trees down. So what we're doing is we're not going to put out the fire. Some people would have you do that. You know, some traditions will say, don't think. Thinking is bad. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with fire. There's just something wrong with stupidity, the stupid use of fire. So in order to avoid stupidity, people have become even stupider by deciding not to use the intellect at all. Just because there's a wrong way to drive a car doesn't mean we should walk forever, which is unfortunately the conclusion that many traditions have come to. You could get into an accident, so don't drive, right? No. Tantric yoga is very clear about this. You must drive. Not only must you drive, you must make sure you're driving a Ferrari like that. Your, your mind and intellect must be so purified and used in such a precise way. So we're going to study the Sri Shankara Aprochana Bhuti for that. It's a controlled fire that we're going to use to burn everything into its purest form, into ash. We're going to burn away all illusions. And so what does the Jnana Marga give you? It gives you, it gives you renunciation. That's the thing. It gives you total indifference, aloofness, a leonine strength to simply say no to those things that you now understand will not fulfill you. It's the strength to say, I will not be drawn into these patterns over and over and over again. That's it. It gives you that. So notice it's kind of like a solar. I mean, in this tradition, the feminine force is the fiery solar force. But I guess in the Western lexicon, you could say it's kind of a masculine sort of vibe, right? It's a very Shiva energy. It's like a Shiva only energy. It's a sword. It's a penetrative sort of tool. It's the intellect. So that's one side of it. Now, Shiva and Shakti are inseparable. So those who say, ah, intellect is all we need. Intellect alone will do it. They're at a, a great danger because what will happen is you might get renunciation, but you won't get love. You won't get that sublimity, that sense of attachment. So detachment and attachment must always go together because if detachment is there without attention, mark this, sorry, without attachment, mark this carefully, it will be a very numb, deadened, void state. This is what you could call nihilistic tranquility. So without bhakti, jnana on its own can sometimes be very disequilibrating. It can be, and, and the, the crit criticism is typically, it's very dry in the sense that you're left with this sense of illusoriness. The world is nothing. It's been burnt to ash, but then maybe nothing is there like that. There's a nihilism that creeps up on you when you just use a sword only and you just burn things down. So you can go too far. On the other hand is bhakti. So bhakti, directs your emotion, emotive force, your motive force rather, towards something worth desiring, towards the infinite, towards God, which ultimately is none other than the Atman, Brahman, Shiva of Jnana. So the goal of Jnana and the goal of Bhakti is the same. Your own innate divinity, the source of all purity, perfection, and bliss. That's the goal. But the way to attain that goal, which is in more appropriate language, the way to recognize the inherent nature of that goal as being part of every moment as the ground of every moment, the way to recognize that is to do this double action of pushing and grabbing. So through renunciation, we push away that which is false. Through bhakti, we grab onto that which is true. So there's this feminine sort of force of embrace, and there's this masculine sort of force of cutting away. So jnana, the intellect, does that work of cutting away. Bhakti, the path of the heart or the emotional cultivation, does that work of latching onto so the only way you can achieve renunciation is by loving something more worth loving than those things that are falling away. Do you see? So they go together. They're to be used together. Now, this isn't to say that they can be used exclusively. Certainly they can. A bird can, I mean, sort of make its way, right? You can sort of ride a tricycle and you can maybe sort of like, I don't know, uh, get by with one eye. You could, and people have, right? Absolutely people have. So it's important then to note that while each of these paths can work exclusively, the tantric approach to yoga is to marry the two. Why? Because we don't see dichotomies. Shiva and Shakti what? 
Shakti is inseparable from Shiva, meaning bhakti is inseparable from jnana. The jnani is deeply devoted and the bhakta is very philosophically inquisitive, like that. There's no difference. So in order to prove that, to show you that they only appear different on the surface, but in actuality, they are one and the same. I thought this Friday night series would be a cool way to study two, two texts next to one another, right? So let's start with our Narada Bhakti Sutra. We've been doing that anyway, and we're kind of on a roll with that. And there's a nice transition because the Narada Bhakti Sutra, we just finished talking about that section on renunciation. So you'll recall the first verse introduces the text, Atato Bhakti Vyak Yasyamaha. And now there is to be an exposition on Bhakti. The second verse tells you what bhakti is. Sa tu asmin parama prema rupaha. Bhakti is none other than, or in fact, bhakti is like rupa. Bhakti is like supreme superlative love for this. This being undefined. But the fact that it's a this, I've stressed over and over, has a kind of non-dual flavor here. That it's not some being in a sky far away. It's not an, a, a post-samadhi attainment. Rather, it's something that's very tangible, very real, very immediate, very present. You, the essence of who you are. So that's verse two. Verse three, Amrita Swarupacha. Moreover, this bhakti, which is the supreme love for this, is um, itself the nectar of immortality. It's moksha. So it's in and of itself moksha. To love is to be free. He, he or she who loves is a free person. Okay, so true love must be free. In fact, let me just make that the standard. Okay, true love frees you. This is Swami Vivekananda's golden rule. If it binds you, it's not love. It's something masquerading as love, parading about as love. So if you say, I love you to someone, and then you restrict all of their movements, do you really love them? Or are you just using the word love to justify your enslavement of them, right? Or if you say, I really love my job, um, is that really love when you feel like you can't drop it at any time and move on to a new thing? Anytime you call something love and find that you're oppressed by it, restricted by it, bound by it, anytime you find that your freedom is somewhat diminished by it, then that cannot be love. That's not an appropriate use of the word love. Whereas, according to Swami Vekananda, the golden rule is that if it frees you, it's love. So that which liberates, that which empowers, that which frees, that's love. So love is always freeing. So notice verse 3 is making this profound claim. To love is to be free. For freedom is the very nature of love. And you know, when we gloss this verse, I think I told you about like the teenager who's having a crush. So when, when she's crushing, it doesn't matter that there's a quiz the next day. All the other kids in class are so worried about the quiz, you know, all night long they're studying. This teenager doesn't care whether she fails or passes, she's crushing on someone. So her very love in her crush frees her from the travails and, you know, foibles of her schooling life. So when you love something worth loving, that love itself frees you from concerns about things that have nothing to do with your beloved, like that. So love should be freeing. That's what verse three says. Okay, done. That makes the section of the text. And we learned so much from it already. We learned that the object of our love is not out there. It's more likely the supreme subject that's in here as me. We also learned that bhakti is nothing but supreme love. And that love itself is freedom. Okay, first three verses. Then we learned what you might attain inadvertently through bhakti. You learned in verse four that yallabdhva, um, siddho bhavati, amrito bhavati, tripto bhavati, having attained bhakti, meaning having attained love, once you come to love God with all your heart and with all your might, which was Jesus's first teaching, his first commandment was that to love your God with all your heart, all your strength and all your might, all your being. Once you come to do that, once that love awakens in you, then necessarily you will attain perfection for that love is perfection. Necessarily you will retain, uh, attain immortality and necessarily you will attain eternal satisfaction, love being a reward unto itself. Okay, next, uh, yat uh, prapti, and then we learned a few other things. Na dveshti, na shochati, na ramate, na utsahi, like that. We learned that there's no more grief. There's no more, um, there's no more aversion, dveshti. There's no dveshti, no aversion, no more grief, no more hankering after things, no more exertion. Life becomes very easeful, effortless, and in some ways, self-satisfying. Self -satisfying. So that was the seventh verse. Then in the eighth verse, sorry, no, that was the fifth verse. Then in the sixth verse, we get the word gyatva, yat gyatva. So knowing which, again, a kind of non-dual jnana marga type of word in a bhakti text. Knowing which, here knowledge and love seem to be united. Knowing bhakti, meaning attaining that knowledge, perhaps you could read it that way. Knowing which, one becomes drunk, madho bhavati, intoxicated like Shri Krishna. One becomes stabdho bhavati. Uh, still and silent, stupefied almost, like Sri Ramakrishna would go into these states where he would need to be propped up by someone because he's stunned and the hairs on his 
skin would raise like goosebumps like that. Can you imagine his hair all standing on end and he's just like petrified, like in the Harry Potter movies, you know, they all get petrified like that. It's like that, except it's a highly alive state in which he's merged with God. And after that, when he comes down, so to speak, from that state, he sways and staggers as if drunk. He's absolutely blissed out. So this knowledge, this jnana, yat gyatva, the word there is jnana, yat gyatva, this knowledge causes drunkenness, divine inebriation, divine madness even. It causes uh, stupefaction or stillness or silence. It makes one silent. Like Sri Ramakrishna says, when the bee is sipping the honey, it's silent. No. Of course, when drunk on the honey, it might start to buzz again and therefore teach others. But while it's there sipping the honey, it becomes silent. Okay, so that's the sixth verse. Now we come to this very, very important section, the section on renunciation. In fact, you could see the whole Aparokshana Bhuti of Sri Shankara, as I would even argue, an elaboration of verses 7 through 10. And that's what we spend the majority of last week's class on. So I'm not going to go into it today. So I want to make some progress into the class. So you can just refer to the last, I think, four or five or maybe even six lectures. Maybe even seven lectures. Maybe, I don't know, however many lectures we just did, all of them were about renunciation. Because if there's one thing you take away from any of what I've said, it's this, friends. Renunciation, renunciation, renunciation. The word renunciation means absolute freedom and absolute love. Renunciation means indifference to all that is not ultimately fulfilling. And it also means tremendous attachment towards that which is. When I say renunciation, I'm talking of a life inflamed with prayer, a life of deep devotion and unfaltering, uninterrupted passion. It's a life of awake arise. It's a life of constant dogged tenacity towards that which already is. It's a life lived in God, a life lived in spirit exclusively. That's what I mean by renunciation. When I say renunciation, I mean unselfishness. I mean total compassion for all beings that can only come from emptying yourself out of every notion of what you think you are or what you think you're here to do. It comes ultimately from a conviction, a conviction about who you really are. Even now you can have that conviction. And once that conviction arises in you, you will have this courage, this grit, the ability to say simply, um, I'm free and mean it and actually be free. You know, no longer will you reach for things that harm you. That's what renunciation is. And you know, I, I'm not gonna say it. I'm gonna let Swamiji say it. So today I'm gonna read to you just as we transition from this class into the next one. I wanna read to you from one of my favorite uh, Swamiji speeches of all time. Of course I have many favorites, but this is, I think recently my particular favorite, it's called The Secret of Work. And it was delivered in Los Angeles here um, in the 1900s. So it was delivered quite some time ago, about a century ago in January. So on January 4th, Swamiji spoke this speech. It was a very, very inspired speech. And the central thrust of the speech was renunciation. And I'm just gonna read it to you so you can hear it in his words. But verses seven through 10 are ultimately about renunciation. And what that ultimately is, I'll leave it to Swamiji to describe. So I'm just going to move on from here. Um, but just now just stressing that renunciation. Okay, so now let's come into the topic for today, which is scripture. So we, we did verse 7, sana, kama, yana, nirodha, rupatvat, like that. We did all of that. So we learned about this thing called nyasa. Loka, Veda, Vyapara, nyasa. We learned about consecrating every action, sacred and secular, towards the divine. We learned about um, ananyata. Anya means other. So an, 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 you know, means not. So ananyata, an, anyata means the state whereby we are non-othered, meaning non-bothered or non-disturbed or non-perturbed, essentially single-pointed. So we learned that what renunciation is, is consecrating all actions sacred and secular towards the goal. And what that really looks like is single-pointedness. And I explained that that means clarity and conviction about your purpose in life as being nothing other than spirituality, right? Then we learned about an ashraya. And that single pointedness looks like not building your house on sand, but building your house on rock. That is not putting your stock in the things of the world that moth and rust and doth corrupt, you know, like that. So we learned all about an ashraya. Now transitioning. So we'll let Swamiji say more there. You see how um, reluctant I am to transition from this, this part about renunciation? Because I feel like I have nothing else to say but that. Renunciation, renunciation, renunciation. That's the only message. Read the Buddha, read the Christ, read Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda chapters, on volume one through nine. It's like all throughout the entire work is this one phrase. Strength, 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 which ultimately means renounce, renounce, renounce. 
which is absolute freedom, absolute compassion. Okay, so with great reluctance, let's move on. <laughs> now, verse 8. Sorry, what? Verse 11. Loka vedeshu tadan uh, tad anukula charanam tad virodishu udasinata. Now, I'm going to try again with this Devanagri. But as we know, uh, we've been having some problems, right, with the Devanagri where for some reason, the compound consonants don't want to go into the Zoom. So just forgive me, okay, if it seems like these compound consonants, I mean, oh my God. This one's not too bad. There's not that many compound consonants. But I'm just going to put the transliteration here as well so that you can see it. And we'll just work with this verse today. Okay, here we go. Uh, it's not too bad. Okay, sure. Most of it came through anyway. Oh, yeah, Bogdan. Thank you so much. Bogdan is always so helpful. He gives the actual Sanskrit here. So this one actually was like not too bad. I'm not too upset by this one. But you, you've noticed like in the past, like we'll miss a shri, like a sh or a ra. Like they'll just be these like dropped compound consonants, you know? Like even here, this like, yeah, okay. So anyway. So just note that the, the Devanagri could be a little wonky, okay? So if you find like some syllables are not corresponding with the transliteration, so be it. Loka. Loka means secular injunction or public opinion. Loka meaning like just what is commonly believed to be the way to behave. Vedeshu means that which was prescribed by scripture, that which is a spiritual or sacred injunction. So taken together, this word means loka vedeshu. It together means the injunctions of both society and scripture. Tad, as you know, means that. Anukula means uh, favorable. Acha, achara means uh, behavior. One's conduct, achara. You know, a lot of the tantras, they're about kriya, yoga, and achara. Meaning they're about spiritual practices. Uh, they're about like ritual techniques and also they're about ways to behave so yamas and niyamas like that these are acharas ways to conduct yourself as a spiritual person so the word here annu kula means favorable and acharanam means conduct thud again that virodishu again this is a phrase that you encountered earlier you'll remember in verse um i think it was nine right no yeah, I think it was in verse 9. Yeah, verse 9, we learned, Tasmin ananyata tad viro dishu udasinata. So already in your vocabulary are these two very important words. Viro dishu, which means that which is opposed to, and udasinata, meaning indifference. So one should have indifference to those activities that are unfavorable or opposed to the injunctions of the scriptures and society. Isn't that interesting? That's, that's all it is. It says one should abide by the scriptures and public opinion, and one should be indifferent towards that which is itself unfavorable or in opposition to scriptures. So essentially what the verse is saying is scriptures are great, everyone. Scriptures rock. Uh, now let me make a case for that. So the main thing I want to say in this class is why are scriptures valuable? Okay, so everything I say in these lectures, I want you to hold me to this. This is kind of my commitment. It must pass through four gates, as I said yesterday. One, it must be true in the light of my own experience, pratyaksha. So it must be anecdotally true. I don't want to talk about anything that I haven't at least in some way glimpsed, right? I think that's a good principle. We shouldn't speak of things we know nothing about or haven't experienced. Remember, I told you I once picked up a book on the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali by a pandit uh, from the library. And I was so struck by how complex it was. It was just so convoluted and obfuscated and difficult to read. And I, I, I left that thinking, wow, this yoga stuff is really just, it's really complex. And then I started reading commentaries from people who really knew what they were talking about and who had entered into such states of absorption. And immediately I realized this with, with such stark difference, you know, they, they made it so simple. It is like yoga is so simple. It's laughably simple. It's so simple that if you give it to an intelligent person, they'll overly complicate it. You know, so there's a big difference between hearing something spoken from experience versus spoken from intellectual understanding. So I think our first commitment with one another should be, let's speak from what we've experienced or at least glimpsed and not from what we think is true, but have never really for ourselves tasted, right? That's one thing. So that's the first gate. For something to be true, it must check out in my own direct experience. This is called pratyaksha. 
and I'll put it in the chat. So this will be part of our study questions anyway, like to name the four gates or to name the four uh, tests for truth. So the first, pratyaksha, direct experience. Does it check out with my own experience, both internally and externally? That's the first. The second one is called sattarka. It's actually a very important phrase in Shaivism. Abhinava Gupta perhaps coined it, but this means uh, reason. And reason here is reasoning based on direct experiences. So if something is true in my experience, it should also hold up to reason. Now for the power of reason, I refer you to Swami Vivekananda's incredible lecture, Reason and Religion, which he gave in London, which appears in volume one of the complete works. So in any case, reason is very important because the way we communicate with one another, obviously it's not the be all end all, but it's great and it's wonderful. And it helps us temper our experiences so we don't become idiosyncratic with them. Okay, so reason. The next thing is, is it reasonable? Does this check out with reason? Okay, third thing is, and this is very important, Sadhguru. Is this in line with what I learned from my teacher? Uh, words of the teacher or the Acharya. In other words, the teacher being a living embodiment of the tradition is my check and balance against my own faulty reasoning based on my own faulty interpretation of my experiences. So if I have an experience, but not good reasoning skills, I might come to the wrong conclusion about what that experience means. And therefore I might act in ways that are actually harmful to myself and to others. In other words, I might act in ways that are not enjoined by scriptures and public opinion. Interestingly, why? Why am I doing that? Because I had an experience, no doubt, but I didn't come to the right conclusion about that experience. So I need reason. Reason will help me uh, temper and properly channelize the raw emotive force of an experience. Next, it's not enough to reason because as we know, some of us have very faulty reason. In fact, most of us, tend to have errors in our reasoning that we never ourselves understand until someone points out. You know, so for the longest time, I was incorrectly reading some verses in the uh, Vigyana Bhairava and Harishji was very kind to point out my error. And I'm very grateful to him because I never would have seen it. And I, I only saw it after he had pointed it out. So my teachers like Professor Staneshwa Tamal Sinaji, Acharya, uh, Harishji, all that. And, and of course my gurus, like these people, they're scholars and they catch me when I make an intellectual error. And I have great faith in my reasoning ability. I feel quite haughty about my own reasoning. I think I'm a pretty intelligent guy. And the very fact that even though I think that I make mistakes all the time shows me that reason is not that like dependable, right? It's dependable, but not that dependable. So I must ultimately go to my guru and I place before my guru, my experience. And not only that, I place before my guru, my interpretation of my experience. And I ask him, was I right in coming to this conclusion? Am I right in acting in this way based on my conclusion? And my guru, of course, being, a spiritual master, but also someone who's walked the path for much longer than me is able to say, ha, my reasoning has an emotional seasoning. I love that, right? There's, there's no such thing as thinking in a vacuum, right? Thinking is always something that happens um, colored by reason, preconditioning, bias. We almost reason based on what we want to be true. Very few of us are truly, truly reasonable, rational agents. Anyway, so that's what the guru is for. The guru is not getting any money out of you. That's very important. Even if you offered a dakshina during the time of your initiation, it's not like, you know, there, there's like this constant, like the guru doesn't want money from you. So, you know, the guru has no reason to say anything based on commercial interest. The guru has nothing to gain from you. So, you know, the guru only means well. I mean, that's one of the standards for even taking a guru. The guru must be absolutely pure and have nothing to gain from you. And th therefore you can trust that the guru when they speak only speaks for your benefit. The guru wants nothing but your advancement, your spiritual advancement for its own sake right? Not to brag about it. Oh, look at what disciple I have. No, no. You must trust that your guru is indeed pure. And for that, you must test that your guru is indeed pure. <laughs> okay. So choosing a good guru is very important. And uh, the test of a guru is selflessness. The test of a guru is that they're in it for none, nothing else other than just the love of, of I mean, I, I like the podcast title. It's called For the Love of Yoga. It's, it's for the love, for the love of yoga. Hopefully that's what this all, all this is about. Anyway, so when you convey something to your guru, it's with great faith that what your guru will say will be for your ultimate good. So the guru might ultimately say, no, your reasoning is way off kilter here. It's, it's whack. Revise your conclusion. Or your guru might say, I'm not sure about that experience. Or your guru might, more often in my case, just dismiss the experience entirely as even valuable. What's, ma what, what's valuable, my guru will say, it's character building. It's what the experience leaves you with. It's not the experience itself. Anybody can see flashing lights and experience feelings here and there. That's not really what spiritual life is about. Spiritual life is about the transformation that is stable and lasting, perhaps as a result of experience or maybe not. So anyway, the guru will do that for you, right? Now there's one final gate, the last gate that all of this must be checked against. 
and that is Sad Agama. Agama, as you know, means the revealed scriptures. Uh, Agama means that which is heard, like Shruti, that which is given, like Kabbalah. The word Kabbalah, I think, means that also to the Hebrews. So Agama, it's, it's a tantric word, of course. Agamas refer to the revelation of Lord Shiva. But essentially, the word Agama in its broader sense just means scripture. Shruti, like Vedas, Upanishads, Bible, whatever. You know, whatever holy scripture there is, Quran. And it's not to say that all of these scriptures are perfect. Certainly, there's some sand mixed in with the sugar. Certainly, in all scriptures all over the world, there's a little bit of superstition commingled here and there with profound rapturous truth, right? No scripture is perfect. Like Sri Ramakrishna said, all religions contain a few errors here and there in it. Just like everyone's watch is a little bit different, you know, right? The watch metaphor, no one's watch tells the same time back then. Now, maybe it's different with smart watches. Back then, nobody's, no two watches told the same time. We all have the tendency, my watch alone is right. My watch gives the right time. So my book alone is the best thump, right? We thump each other on the head with the book. But no, no book is ultimately right. Every book is just one way of looking at one truth that's too vast to be confined to any one book. But the books do have a lot to say and a lot of true things, and they're mostly true. They're mostly sugar with some grains of sand. So while it is in, like certainly the case, undeniably, that books are not infallible, and certainly they couldn't be because they still have to pass through the gates of experience, reason, and guru. So by the way, if you're going off of a book, but you have no direct experience, or your reasoning is out of line, or you have no guru. Remember in the Orthodox Christian tradition, it's really stressed that you have an elder, a preceptor, someone to guide you on the path. It has to be more than just a pastor. It has to be someone who themselves has direct mystical experience, you know? So unless you have experience, reason, and guru, it doesn't matter if your book is perfect. And even if your book is not perfect, it's checked and balanced by those other three. Anyway, now let me talk about why the book is valuable. Now the book in Indian sense, in the Indian sense is not a book. That's one of the beauties of Indian spirituality is it's not a single book culture. No one book is authoritative. Some books might be more valuable to some sects and other books to others. And in general, when we say scripture, we're talking about a vast a peer-reviewed systems of commentary and translation and transmission. So a text might appear and that text might be transmitted from guru to disciple, copied and then recopied, or even translated from Sanskrit to other languages like Kashmiri, what have you, you know? So this translation work, this copying work, and most of all, most importantly, this commentarial work is what keeps scriptures pure. So yeah, um, his reply was in that case, amend the scripture, exactly. Because the Buddha is a living embodiment of the scripture as a teacher. In fact, what the teacher will do is not amend the scripture. The teacher will select for you parts of the overall tradition that the teacher feels is relevant to your sadhana, leaving out parts that aren't. Now, Abhinava Gupta, I want to say a few words about his use of scripture. He was a great tantric master. Like Sri Ramakrishna, he had many gurus, maybe like 16 or 19 or something. He learned from everyone. He was curious about Jainism, so he had a Jain guru. He was interested in Buddhism, so he had a Buddhist guru. He learned the Trika, the Pratyabhigya, the Krama. He learned from everyone. You know, He was very interested in all forms of spirituality in his time. But he wasn't like an American New Ager. Okay? He wasn't like a California hippie smearing himself thin over so many different practices and not really going deeply into any one of them. He wasn't like that. Like Sri Ramakrishna, whenever he took something up with great tenacity, focus, and perseverance, he stuck with it until he attained its fruit. So he surpassed most of his teachers because of his spiritual competence, much like Sri Ramakrishna. I'm telling you, the parallels, parallels are kind of eerie here. It's very beautiful. So anyway, Abhinava Gupta studies broadly. He goes very far into each tradition that he studies. And as a result, because he also has like a steel trap memory, um, as a result, he has this vast storehouse of scripture just in him. It's just a part of him. So when he sits down to write his Tantra Loka, some 6,000 verses of incredible poetic, they're shlokas. So they're all in rhyme scheme, right? Uh, Anishtu meter, many of them. So like 6,000 verses, he starts quoting, uh, apparently from memory, so many different scriptures, scriptures that are so diverse in nature. He's, he quotes from scriptures that have a bad rep of being magical books that are about powers. And he's not at all interested in cultivating powers like that. Yet he liberally pulls from books that are mostly about power and sensuality, showing that there can be grains of sugar even in texts that are mostly sand. And he's not close to like sifting through the sand to give you the sugar. So notice what he's doing is as a guru, he's going through his tremendous understanding of scripture and selecting things that he thinks would be valuable and coherent for his teaching and then packaging, packaging them all together and then commenting on them. So Tantra Loka is an exegetical work. So it comments upon scriptures. So you know what we're doing now? We're doing exegesis. 
I presented to you a scripture, the Narada Bhakti Sutra. And now together, you and I are investigating the scripture. We're commenting upon the scripture. We're trying to figure out what words mean. But not only that, we're contextualizing the scripture against the broader scriptural tradition. So in this course, we talked about the Yoga Sutra of Narada. You know, we talked about Shankara's Aparakshanabhuti. We talked about various tantras. We talked about like exegetical works like like we're doing now, Tantra Loka. So notice, in order to study scripture, we have to study it against the backdrop of all other scriptures. So that's what makes the Indian scriptural tradition quite robust because of this exegetical tradition and because of the ability of the guru to uh, discern and to like leave out that which is not helpful and to double down on that which is helpful. And so there's a kind of sense in which the scripture is customizable, you know? And so a guru typically they won't, they won't break scripture. They very seldom do. Sri Ramakrishna never does. And Sri Ramakrishna, by the way, the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is not scripture. Please don't make this mistake. The gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is not scripture. Some people say that it's the fifth Veda, but Swamiji did not think that way. He said, and he clearly said, as you'll see in the end of the Seeing God with Open Eyes by Swami Chaitananda Ji, he there talks about some of Swamiji's very important ideas for founding this organization. He said, Swamiji, Swami Vekananda, he said that we must look upon the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna as a commentary on the Vedas, just like the Bhagavad Gita. It's not to turn into a Guru Granth Sahib or anything like that. Because to do so would be to close us off of, from all the other scriptures. Because Swamiji says, by Vedas, no books are meant, which keeps the tradition very liberal and open and able to absorb powerful ideas from Christianity, Islam, etc. There's a very important idea that Indian scripture is about a lot more than one book, to say the least. It's a tradition of peer review, of comparative study, of transmission from guru to student. And you know, another thing about scripture I think is quite valuable to say in this class is the best stuff survives. Remember, this is a 5,000 year old tradition. So the stuff that gets copied and recopied and translated and distributed is clearly the stuff that has the most value because that's the only reason why a guru would offer it to the disciple. The guru offers it because the guru found value in that text in their own sadhana. So the guru was able to attain the fruit of a sadhana and therefore conveyed that to the disciple. If the disciple was not able to attain the fruit, they might not teach it to their disciple. And so that text kind of over time just gets weeded out. It's like almost a process of evolution. It's like almost Richard um, Dawkins kind of meme theory like these cultural memes go through a series of evolutionary cycles, like there's mutations and there's variations. And it's almost like the survival of the fittest when it comes to ideas. Similarly, in Indian scriptural tradition, the ideas that are the best, meaning the ideas that are the most effective at conveying direct, immediate realization, those were the ideas that were transmitted unerringly and unfailingly down through the present day. So 5,000 years by conservative estimates of scriptural tradition is arriving now at your very feet as this Bhakti Sutra. Or as this tantra look. Isn't that so cool? Right? Also, I think it's worth mentioning that um, they're very, it's very difficult to doctor Vedas and Upanishads because the rhyme scheme is so absolutely tight and it's an oral culture that stresses the absolute importance of memory that even though these texts are for the most part transmitted orally, uh, for some reason, there's very little cultural decay. And this is like your one Google away from this really incredible study of how cultures across India have somehow managed to attain with remarkable authenticity. These are cultures in different regions, you know, are able to maintain with remarkable authenticity antiquated texts, largely because of the inbuilt systems of checks and balances, namely the rhyme schemes, etc. I don't want to get into that too much, but essentially I'm making a case now for why scripture can be trusted. Why it's not just a pile of books. It's not. It's rather a peer-reviewed, comprehensive uh, account of what spiritual life is, full of checks and balances. And um, the fact that you can disagree is very important too. Like Shankara has a different idea of what the Gita says than Madhavacharya. Certainly they both have a different idea of the Gita than Ramanuja. And all three of these exegetical works, Bhashyas, commentaries on the Gita, are all accepted as authoritative. Some for different sects and others for other sects, like that. That's the beauty of Indian scriptural tradition that I think we should bring with us to other scriptural traditions. Let's be hesitant to make one book the be-all, end-all book. It might be for you, but not for someone else. And let's make sure that there's a healthy commentarial tradition that's allowed to thrive. Like in the Quran, you have the subsidiary Hadith, which is a commentarial exegetical kind of uh, appendage to the Quran, trying to understand what the Quran means like that. So that's, I think, my understanding humbly of scripture in Indian spiritual life. And it's not only scripture, it's the social injunctions that are derived from scripture. So Indian social construction is premised upon um, spiritual values. So sages, like for instance, Manu, the great sage and Rishi and King Manu, devised a book called The Law of Manu. Now this isn't Shruti, it's not scripture, it's Smriti. 
meaning it's like social codes of conduct, but that doesn't devalue it. Of course, Shruti is, you know, sacred and holy and all that, but the Smriti is based on the Shruti, meaning it's a, a way to kind of codify into social life the truths expounded by the Vedas. So you get this like Varna Ashrama kind of thing, you get like all this stuff is what we call Loka. So here in the verse, when they say Loka, they're probably like pointing to the Smritis, law of Manu and other codes of conduct, like how you behave in secular society. Then when they're talking about Veda, Vedeshu, they're talking about Shruti's, like Vedas, Upanishads, Agamas, Tantras, depending on your tradition. So basically, this is how you behave in both secular and spiritual life. Now, interestingly, in India, at least uh, for most of its history, up until recently, the Mughal invasion kind of changed this. But even then, it somewhat is the case. But for most of its history, it's vast history, sacred and secular life, there's no real distinction between the two. And Swamiji, as Sister Nivedita rightly says, has come to show that. He's come to blur the lines between sacred and secular, thereby returning us to the age-old Indian ideal of the sacred being secular and the secular being sacred. And so Loka, Vedeshu, almost seems like a redundant statement. There's a way to be a decent citizen in the world. And that way is informed by spirituality. Okay. Now, these are the four gates. If you don't abide by them, dangerous things can happen. You can come to the wrong conclusions about your experience and you can act in ways that are harmful to you and to others. If you don't go to a guru, if you have no guru, then you have no living checks and balances. You might not even know if your interpretation of scripture is correct. And if you have a guru, but no, if, oh, by the way, this is very important to me. If your guru denounces scriptures, denounce that guru. Do you know, because basically a guru who denounces scriptures is a guru who denounces checks and balances. If a guru is really worth her salt, what she says will be in accordance with what every other enlightened person has said, right? Because the scripture is nothing but a collection of sayings from those beings who have attained direct immediate realization. Oh, I notice a very dangerous trend these days of gurus who condescend to scripture because it's just books, right? My ass, it's just books. It's a peer-reviewed collective wisdom of the entire culture commented upon in a system of checks and balances that ensure that the best systems get maintained over thousands of years. It's not just books. <laughs> so any guru who says so, beware, is probably a guru who is avoiding the checks and balances of the scripture. In other words, an, it's a guru who wants a cult of personality saying, if you want truth, you must come to me. But a good guru always points you to the scripture uh, which he or she or they represent. So the guru comes to you in light of scripture and says, I will demonstrate with my own life the truth of what you read in the scripture. And that will reinforce the scripture and the scripture will reinforce my life. So the guru is living canon as Harish Ji said so beautifully. It's a good teaching, right? This is a good way to judge gurus. Uh, a good guru must be, um, I would say, based in a lineage. In other words, I would say, always know who your guru's guru is. And you know what? Even more importantly, know who your guru's disciples are. So you can say a lot about a guru from their disciples. You might not be able to say a lot about a guru from the guru. They typically have a lot of charisma and cult of personality, and they can fool you into thinking they're something they're not. It's very hard to judge a guru based on their own behavior. But one thing never lies. If they have no guru, doubt that. Right? Because they don't belong to a lineage. I mean, there are great masters who were self-taught, like Ramana Maharshi. His guru was Arunachala. But even then, do you know how many scriptures that Ramana Maharshi commented upon? Like he had, um, what's his name? Ganapati Muni brought to him many scriptures and stuff like that. And he commented upon Ashtavakra, Tripura, Rahasya. He was very friendly to scriptures, you know. Despite the austerity of his message, he quoted them. He referenced them all these great masters. So it's not, it's not, maybe Arunachala was his guru and it doesn't matter that he doesn't have like a direct lineage that we can point to, but he was very favorable to scriptures, Ramana Maharshi. Most teachers will have teachers because to be a good teacher, you must be a good student. So to, to judge a teacher, judge them by the standard of their own discipleship, right? That's one. And I would say this is even more important. You know how you know Sri Ramakrishna is worth his salt? Because of Swamiji. And you know, you know how you know Swami Vivekananda is worth his salt? Because of Sister Nivedita. Read the complete works of Sister Nivedita and you'll see the value of Swami Vivekananda. Then, of course, read Swami Vivekananda and you'll truly understand what Sri Ramakrishna is. Like that. So the quality of the disciple always speaks to the quality of the guru. Anyway, a good guru is necessarily going to be part of a lineage and part of a scriptural tradition and therefore respectful of it. And necessarily, they're going to make sure that their words are in alignment. And look at Lakshmanju. You know, most of his discourses were given as commentary on scripture. So the best stuff sometimes is his Bhagavad Gita. You know, he does the Gitas... Uh, um, Abhinava Gupta's Bhagavad Gita, Gitarta Sangraha, comments on it. He comments on the Vigyana Bhairava. And he just, you know, off the cuff comments based on his own experience, his own reasoning, what he heard from his teacher. But again, he's staying with the scripture. 
So mark my words, very important. A good teacher, at least from our Indian point of view, is a teacher who stays um, accountable by referencing scripture. So you, of course, should know scripture. When approaching a teacher, you should know scripture um, of all traditions, because by that you can judge the fruit, right? Okay. So that's why I think, friends, it's very important that you come to these classes. Very, very important. It's very important that you have an intellectual understanding of all of this. I would make pandits of you all. In other words, you must be able to understand yoga through and through, yoga system. Understand, maybe we haven't started Nyaya yet. Um, we should understand that. We should study some Nyaya text. We should study Bhakti in all of its different schools. Ramanuja, Madhava, Nimbarka, like that. Vallabha, you know. We should study Bhaskara against Shankara. We should really know Shankara. So I'm a Tantric. I, I, I love Tantra Loka. Why am I doing Aprochana Bhuti? Because you must master Vedanta also. There's no Tantra without Vedanta. There's no rock and roll without blues, baby. I once heard, right, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, someone said, if you don't know the blues, you ain't gonna get to rock and roll. And I was like, yeah. If you don't master Vedanta, what do you know of Tantra? Master it, I'm saying intellectually at least. Okay, so hence scripture. Now look at what the verse is saying. The verse is essentially saying, and I'll close with this sentiment. The verse is saying that um, when a person attains bhakti, they become indifferent to activities that are otherwise opposed to scripture and to social injunctions. So in other words, their actions will typically be ethical and be in alignment with what is prescribed by the scriptures. So the thing about Sri Ramakrishna, he was incredibly eccentric, right? Sometimes he acted like a ghoul, sometimes like an inert thing. After all, Madho Bhavati. By the way, those of you who have been following these lectures, you might sense a contradiction. Didn't you just say a few lectures ago about like the eccentricity of the spiritual person? They become drunk, intoxicated, and sway and stagger, right? Many people thought Sri Ramakrishna was a madman. They become silent and still. I mean, it's super weird, by the way, to be at a party and then just suddenly become still and then everybody makes a fuss and someone needs to prop you up. And then even Swamiji made fun of this, right? Like just like towards the end of the gospel, Swamiji pretends to go into Samadhi and then he's like, give me water. I need water. Like he's just making fun of his master and everyone's laughing. It's so beautiful. Like, but it is funny, right? It's like out of the norm to do that. So yeah, Sri Ramakrishna was incredibly eccentric. He behaved like a ghoul, like an inert thing, like a, a child of five. You know, he behaved in age of inappropriate ways. Like when he would demand Gola, uh, Gopal Ma to like cook him curries and stuff. You know, like he, he was a cranky child sometimes and so gullible, like as a grown man, he would just believe whatever he was told. He was so gullible about everything. So obviously there are ways that Sri Ramakrishna seemed to be an eccentric and hard to understand because of it. People thought he was mad because of it. And now I'm saying a bhakta is going to be aligned with the injunction. So which is it, right? There's a contradiction, it seems. No. One interesting thing about Sri Ramakrishna is that pandits like Gauri and Vaishnavacharan would come to him and analyze all of his behavior in the light of the scriptures. In fact, they found the truth of their scriptures in watching Sri Ramakrishna, and we understood Sri Ramakrishna in light of the scriptures because the scriptures describe everything about what was happening to Sri Ramakrishna. So when Bhairavi Brahmani came, Sri Ramakrishna was suffering from an ailment caused by his excessive bhakti. You know, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to get into that. But his skin was burning and whatever. So Rani Rasmani, no, sorry, Bhairavi Brahmani, she comes and she diagnoses his condition based on what she understands of Vaishnava Tantra. And she points out the symptoms in the scripture and corroborates them against the symptoms that he's experiencing. Interestingly, the scripture offers a solution. So she says, if I garland you in jasmine flowers or some kind of wildflower and if i uh, smear sandalwood paste on you my theory is very scientific it should solve the burning now of course the other people in the room like mathur babu were like this is bogus this is baloney please don't believe this like random tantric woman that just appeared one day on a boat claiming you to be the last of her three disciples like this is a bhairavi long hair disheveled like she's a tantric you're right to fear them sometimes, right? Right to fear them. Anyway, so they didn't want to take these like uh, these directions. But Sri Ramakrishna, like a child moved by the divine will of mother, she said, let's try it. So true enough, they put the sandalwood paste, they put the jasmine garland, and he was cured. It was a very scientific, like there was a theory, there was a falsification even, if this didn't work, you know, but it met all the standards of falsification, scientific, popperian falsification, and it worked. Therefore, showing you that for all of Sri Ramakrishna's eccentricities, it was accounted for by the scripture, which shows you the scripture is not what here in America we think, you know, like it's all so stodgy and rigid and has no room. India, for its entire history, has been a <laughs> flooded with mystics, you know, like you can't throw a rock without hitting a babu, a baba, you know, sorry, a baba. You can't, you can't throw a rock in India without 
meeting some holy man who can turn it into like, you know, <laughs> the philosopher's stone. So like, and it's full of sages and sadhus wandering the Himalayas. Of course, a lot of shams also. A lot of, but as Swamiji says, if there are so many imitations, they must be imitating some real thing. All imitation hints at something real being imitated, you know? So even there are a lot of like crackpot, like sham types of charlatans in India. There are like a lot and sometimes in secret of these sadhus. So India has had a long time in its culture and civilization to develop loka and veda vyapara or loka and veda, veda based on that. So that's what it means, right? So this verse is saying, if you are a bhakta, you, your actions, your behaviors should check out. They should be ethical above all. Like Swami, uh, sorry, Sri Ramakrishna himself says, a, a good dancer never makes a bad step. You won't hurt anybody. You won't even hurt a fly. A good dancer never makes a false step. Uh, if you want to know about that, like the morality of this, you can maybe ask in the Q&A. But my claim, I'm not going to justify it. I have in different lectures, is that an enlightened person is always supremely ethical. They always act for the good of all. You know, they don't harm anybody. Even in the beginning, if a teaching might seem fierce, ultimately it's for the greater good of the world. So they're always ethical. They always follow the rules in the sense that they don't need to break them. It's very important, right? There's nothing that an enlightened person does that could be uh, uh, called out by law. Anyway, so, <laughs> so there's nothing about the actions of a person that should be like con condemnable by law or by court or anything like that. <laughs> And um, there's nothing like that would be against scripture. So if you see a guru acting in a way that's directly against scripture, be wary like that. So this is what it's saying. That's one way to understand this verse. Kind of awesome, right? We said a lot, I think. And I, I'm content to leave the lecture alone at this juncture. But I have to say one more thing. Otherwise, I've not done my job. I want to give you Swami Tyagishananda's take. So in his commentary on the Bhakti Sutra, also, look, this is scriptural integrity. We're not just doing one exegesis. We're looking at different authors and their different takes, right? So now let's look at what Swami Tegishananda says. He says that the reason why an enlightened person acts in accordance to scripture is partly to show the truth and validity of scriptures. So Sri Ramakrishna, he was unlettered for the most part. So he didn't really read a lot of scripture. I mean, he assimilated a lot. He was shrutidar, meaning whatever he heard, he retained. And he spent a lot of time with sadhus and, of course, many sadhus. Like in Ramana's case, they would come and visit him and he would just kind of learn through assimilation. But it's not true to say that he was uneducated. Certainly, he knew a lot of scripture. He, he quotes a lot of scripture, by the way. Sri Ramakrishna would just drop like scripture bombs. He was so conversant. And he would even have, he would do wordplay with them. It was awesome. I think you don't really understand something until you can make jokes about it. Sri Ramakrishna was able to just like joke and make wordplay and all that in Bangla. So he clearly knew scripture. He, he, he was scripture, right? But in any case, he didn't study it formally. So he, he, it's not like he studied Sanskrit. He couldn't read and write Sanskrit. He didn't study. And somehow his teachings and his life were in accordance with scripture. In fact, the life of the Christ is in accordance with Indian scripture. So we say you can only really understand the Christ if you understand, I, I would argue, if you understand Indian spirituality, because the Christ is the ultimate ideal of renunciation and India is nothing but renunciation, you know? So it's important, any spiritual person, even if they don't know the scripture, by living their life will justify the scripture. That's why it's important that Sri Ramakrishna didn't know scripture. It's important to me that he didn't read Abhinava Gupta. He didn't know anything about the Kashmir Shaivas because the fact that his philosophy is almost one-to-one -one Kashmir Shaivism is to me a testament to the universal transcultural truth of Kashmir Shaivism. You see? So it's, it's good that Swami Ji didn't know about Abhinava Gupta. Thank God. And it's, it's wonderful that they arrived at the same conclusions in their own way. So Swami Tyagdishananda, in commenting upon this verse, has this to say, that ultimately it's um, a matter of proving the scriptures th true justifying the scriptures. That's the role of an avatar. An avatar comes to revitalize religion. Hmm? So sometimes I say to people, you know, we in America are Christians because this is predominantly a Christian nation. So let's in America revitalize that dharma. It's worth resuscitating. Then when we go to the Middle East, we're Sufis. Why? Because that's a dharma worth resuscitating. When we talk to people of the Jewish faith, we should be Kabbalists, Merkaba mystics. Let's resuscitate that tradition. And when we're in India, let's clean it up of all the superstitious mess. And let's like bring some sanctity back into Indian religions. In other words, what I'm saying is that all dharmas are valid. And wherever you find yourself as a member of the Ramakrishna Sangha, as an apostle, as, uh, uh, as, as a messenger of the dharma, your job is only to uplift and encourage all religion everywhere by proving the scriptures with your life. So you must, through your enlightenment, be a living proof for all scriptures. The Muslim should look at you and say, my Quran is real. The, the Christian should look at you and say, every word of my Bible is proven by your very being. 
the Jewish person must say there is truth and God can be realized and I see it in you. And above all, the, the religions of the world must come together and celebrate universal truth. How? Through your life. Because you as a bhakta prove the validity of A, all morality, and B, all scripture. So that I think is a really hot take and I wanted to leave you with it. So Swami Tyagishananda's take on living scripture as a bhakta. Okay, satisfied? Are we happy? That's verse um, 11, everyone. So next week, we're going to do verse 12. And uh, next week, we're going to talk about safeguards against um, disaster because it's all about falling. So chapter 12, verse 12, rather, is about falling from the path and how to protect yourself. And next week, I'm going to be a bit fierce. I'm going to talk about gurus who have lost the way. Not directly, of course. I don't ever mean to speak badly about anyone anywhere. But I mean, like, we're going to talk about gurus that maybe, at, like, have preached dharmas that were harmful, like the cult leader types. And we're going to see why that happened. And in fact, we're going to point to specific moments when that departure occurred, right? So that's coming up next week. Pretty spicy and juicy lecture. I hope to see you there. Let's close the talk here. I'll just chant. And then I'm going to read you some Swamiji after this. Okay. Om Jayanti Mangala Kali Bhadra Kali Kapalini Durga Akshama Shivadhatri Swaha Swadha Namostute Om Shanti 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 Hi Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Sri Ram Krishna Arpanam Astu Om Tat Sat